Hi there, thanks for joining us on a Q&A edition of Space Nuts. My name is Andrew Dunkley, your host. Always good to have your company, and that was Fred's chair. Coming up in this episode... Uh, <laughs> you're not supposed to be on yet. Do it, yeah. <laughs> Coming up in this episode, uh, what if the expansion of the universe slowed down? Somebody wants to know. Uh, we've also got a, uh, a triple header question from Chris about three sun systems merging black holes and attraction. And we'll be answering a question about whether or not we've collected matter from the coronal mass ejection, not the a coronal mass ejection, because they you know, they happen a lot. And if we've got time, we'll throw in another one, but we'll uh, work with what we've got in this Q&A edition of Space Nuts. 15 seconds, guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. I didn't realise he was here. He's so quiet. He's Professor Fred Watson. Hello, Fred. <laughs> I have to. I apologise for my creaking chair. Did <laughs> um, explain the chair was here, but I wasn't. Well, no, yes, not quite true. But... No, <laughs> there it goes again. Not. There it is. Mine doesn't do that, but the 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 microphone arm does. Don't know if you can. Oh, no, it's not doing it now. It's like taking yeah. a car to the mechanic. Oh, I've got this noise. No, you haven't. Yeah. No, yeah. Right. I think um, maybe I'll try a bit of WD-40 or something. Like yes. That. It's good stuff, that. Mm, I put it on my breakfast. Now, let's um, <laughs> let's get into some questions. And we've got, we've got a few here. Uh, I think we'll start off with uh, Dave from the beautiful town of Inverell in northwest New South Wales, uh, which is known for, for its gems, uh, gem fossicking, very popular up there. Uh, hi, Andrew and Fred. Previously on the show, you've discussed how the universe is expanding faster than the speed of light. Some theories propose this expansion may continue, while others suggest the expansion might eventually slow down. If the latter is correct, could the expansion of the universe slow down to less than the speed of light, therefore allowing light to overtake the edge of the universe? Is this possible, and could light exist outside the universe? Dave from Inverell. Um, I got a feeling you're going to talk about the speed of the expansion of the universe because it was faster than the speed of light initially, but then it did slow down, didn't it? Yeah, it's it's a difficult one to discuss this because um, when you talk about the expansion of the universe being faster than the speed of light, what do you mean? Um, what you what you might mean is that uh, two objects a certain distance apart are moving away from each other faster than the speed of light so that uh, so that one will never see the other um, and and that's the best way to think of it um, you're quite right that we think that during the first 10 to the minus 33 of a second or thereabouts uh, a tiny tiny length of time uh, at the beginning of the universe after immediately after the big bang we think the expansion was colossal that it you know the universe changed shape by or changed size by 10 to the power 50 and 10 to the minus 33 of a second what we call the inflation period that we always under under um, under name things here um and certainly parts of you know the universe bits of the universe would have separated from other bits at faster than the speed of light which doesn't contravene special relativity as we've said before because the universe can do anything it likes uh, what <laughs> we know is that things can't travel through the universe faster than the speed of light. So um, uh, that theory that uh, the universe might collapse in on itself was really knocked on the head in 1998 with the discovery of the acceler accelerated expansion of the universe by mm. my colleague Brian Schmidt uh, here in Australia and others uh, are overseas um, in the United States, in fact. Uh, so th that basically said, no, we don't think the universe is going to collapse any, uh, anymore. Um, but um, in, a, in a way, we're already in the situation that Chris describes because the most distant thing we can see, which is the cosmic microwave background radiation, uh, and that is at a distance, you know, effectively of 13.8 billion light years or a look back time of 13.8 billion years, that is not receding from us uh, faster than the speed of light. 
Uh, in fact, it's receding from us at the speed of light, and we can still see it. And of course, everything between us and that uh, is uh, stuff that is nearer than the cosmic microwave background radiation. So by definition, all that stuff is not moving at the speed of light. We can we can see it all. So it's all about horizons, what you can see and what you can't see. And the, the horizon that really limits our visibility now is the flash of the Big Bang. You're looking so far back in time that you're seeing that that wall of radiation. It's now microwave radiation, hence the name, the cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, and it's traveling for, away from us, I guess, at the speed of light. There you go. Mm. And he also wanted to know if uh, light could exist outside our universe. That's that's a, you know, I guess that's a speculator. Yeah, yeah. We don't, really don't know much about out, the outside of the universe because universe, by definition, is everything that we can perceive or or think about. Uh, but yes, there are people who think that ours might be just one of many universes. Maybe we're immersed in a higher dimensional void, uh, which would perhaps would have light. Um, it might be more appropriate to think, though, that outside the universe might not have light but might have gravity uh, because um, I think you and I have talked about this before. The the force of gravity compared with the other fundamental forces in the universe, and that's electromagnetic force and the strong and weak nuclear forces, uh, it's hundreds of billions of times weaker. The f- force of gravity is much, much, much weaker. And some people speculate that that's because it leaks out of our universe, uh-huh. the space between them. Right. Gosh, wouldn't you love to figure out what's out there? Go out there and... <laughs> yeah. It would it would answer so many questions, I think. But uh, all it we can just... do is speculate and wonder, and you know, we can't even yeah. see past certain parts of the universe, so... Nope. No, we've got no idea, really. Yeah, it could be just, you know, some kind of um, void or it could be a used car sales lot for all we know. It's Yes. It's just, is, it, is, it, is it called the void in Doctor Who? I can't remember. Oh, it might be. Yeah, maybe that's um, what snapped into my brain. Yeah, scientists call it the bulk, actually. The, ah, right. The, uh, cosmology physics name is the bulk. The bulk. Uh, but it's the void. Mm. Uh, for for Doctor Who, Doctor Who, yes, indeed. Uh, okay, Dave, thanks for your question. Hope we managed to help you out there. Let's go to our next question. This is this is a a, a big question. Chris has never asked us a question before, so he's asked uh, basically eight years worth of questions in one hit. <laughs> Take it away, Chris. Hey, Andrew, hey, Professor Watson. My name is Christopher Blue. I'm coming from coming to you from. Hey, North Carolina, United States of America. Love you guys' podcast. I work as an infectious disease technologist, so I'm not allowed to touch my phone. So what I do is I listen to your podcast for eight hours a day, five days a week, and I love it. I'm not going to change anything. Um, actually, speaking to you from the past, I'm on episode 237, and I held held off on asking questions this entire time because I as you all say, it could be a question that was already answered, but I just decided, you know, to heck with that and just ask a question. Anyway, moving on, don't have a lot of time, don't want to take up your time either, but if there was a planetary system that orbited, or excuse me, if there was a planet that uh, or orbited three suns, you know how some systems have binary systems, is it possible to have three, uh, three suns? And if that was the case is it possible for those suns to go into syzygy and cause (laughs) something something like the gravity from all three of those suns added up would lift them off the planet i actually saw that in this show called three body problem if you haven't seen it it's on netflix a great show you will love it um also this is all based on my very small understanding of God's favorite subject, black holes, but black holes are a singularity, infinitely small point in space, and black holes can merge. Would those singular- singularities become one, one singularity, or do they collide? And if they collide, would that be like the Big Bang? Okay, but I just wanted to know that. Um, and last question, I promise, 
for now. Uh, if you, if everything has uh, an attraction, all planets have an attraction. Would everything in space be attracted towards? If nothing else in space had that attraction besides Earth, would all the planets and everything out there just come towards Earth, almost like a homing beacon, and crash into it? But that's all my questions for now. Like I said, love you guys' podcast. I really appreciate it. Actually, it actually urged me to get back into college. I told myself I was never going back, but you guys inspired me to go back. And I do appreciate that. So you guys take it easy um, and have a great day. USA signing off. Thank you, Chris. Wow, that was a lot. Uh, I was um, gobsmacked that uh, you went back to college because of us. I, 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 I'm humbled by that. Fred, what do you think? Yeah, it's great. It's just great to hear, Chris. And um, good luck with the way it's going, all the studies and everything. And keep up the good work with uh, infectious disease technology. That's a very yeah. So he can't uh, he can't touch his phone while he's working. Yeah. So he listens to us. Yeah. Well. Um, oh, look. There's a terrible disease. Oh no, that was just Fred. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think you're the. I think you're the one with the terrible I've disease. Got, I've got yes, um, super pollination. I, that's, what, yes. that's what it's called. Super pollination. Yeah, that, that could yeah. be a thing. Um, now, Chris's questions. Uh, three different questions. The first one's a triple header in itself. A three sun system. What sort of a problem would a planet have orbiting a three sun system? And yes, he mentioned the TV series Three Body Problem, which is based on a book by a Chinese writer. I still haven't finished the first book. It's a, it's a trilogy, um, and uh, yeah, I'm struggling with it because it's really it's a difficult read. Uh, they've turned it into a fabulous TV show, which is very accurate compared to the to the book, which I'm pleased to see uh, so far. Um, but yeah, the, the the problem in the TV series is you've got a planet that's trying to evolve, and intelligent life keeps. De developing but then being destroyed by the problem of trying to survive in a three sun system uh it just can't maintain equilibrium i suppose would be the the way to describe it uh is is that a real thing or are they just making it up no i was going to say when because i as you know i haven't watched um the three body problem but uh as i was listening to chris's question there i thought um this would not be stable. Uh, a planet orbiting three stars, uh, which were themselves orbiting their common centre of mass, uh, almost certainly would be uh, very destructive from a gravitational point of view, that, that, that it wouldn't be a stable situation. Um, and so uh, I think um, Chris's question, his first question, what if they all lined up in what we call syzygy? Uh, yeah, that would certainly provide an interesting bit of gravitational force on the on the uh, the poor planet. If that was also in syzygy with these three stars, uh, you might expect very very uh, intense gravitational effects, uh, which are caused by one side of the planet getting pulled more than the other. Yeah. So uh, so it might you know if it was near enough, it might even get spaghettified like you get when you get too near a black hole. Wow. Uh, so yes, really quite um, quite damaging, I think. Um, uh, but it, it it it's possible it could happen. We've we've covered stories before of planets both orbiting the individual members of a binary star system, a pair of stars, or the whole thing, and we've commented before, I think, on how unstable those, some of those orbits must be, just because of the conflicting gravitational pulls. Yeah, well, they do portray the issues very well in that uh, TV series, Three Body Problem. And yes, they do actually have scenes of people being lifted off the ground because of the gravitational effects of uh, okay. the stars that are, are you know, <clears throat> controlling this planet's fate. Unfortunately, it's very mm. mad for the people. Very bad for the people. Well, I could think it would be, yeah. If you were going to be lifted off the ground, you'd almost certainly get spaghettified, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, pretty yeah. messed up. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Chris's next question was about merging black holes. What basically happens? Do they become one? Um, do they collide? Yes, well, they do. Uh, is it like a mini Big Bang? Uh, well, we know it causes um, gravitational waves. So, yeah, it does mm. make a, a hell of a bang that makes this whoop sound. 
Um, yeah, so, but yeah, but just you know, fill in the blacks for us. Boom, boom. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that you, you're quite right. That's the uh, that's a fairly good impersonation of the of the sound of a or, or of a, a black hole merger captured by LIGO, which is looking at audio frequency, gravitational waves, and then playing them through a loudspeaker. And you do you get the whoop uh, where it sort of merges together. And that bit at the end is where the black holes actually merge. So they do combine into one single black hole of uh, actually a bit less than twice the mass of the individual ones because some of that mass is lost as energy uh, going into the gravitational waves, which are very energy hungry, and that's because space is so rigid. It's Um, like space tax. Yes, yeah, that's right. You can't can't have a merger without paying the tax department. Paying paying the tax, yeah, the gravitational tax. So um, what happens is not a mini Big Bang. Uh, it's quite sedate, actually. It is the, as I s- s- explained, the, the frequency of the, of the gravitational waves goes up because these things are spinning ever closer together. And then they merge, and there is something called the ring down that occurs afterwards. And I think that's just the sort of vibration of the, uh, of the space around it as it settles back down to not having any kind of gravitational waves passing through it. Uh, so the ring down is the the end of the uh, the end of the process, the end of the collision. But it's mm. it's a it's a downward energy thing rather than an upward energy thing, which a, a you know a big bang would be. Okay. Uh, and and yeah, finally, uh, you know, I, I just I, I I just wanted to sort of metaphorically describe that. Then, so emerging black t- two emerging black holes would be more like Fred and Ginger rather than Donald and Camilla. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably, yeah, yeah. All right, um, fair enough. They, um, in fact, Fred and Ginger is probably a good analog because there's a lot of spinning involved. Uh, yes, it's, um, dance cheek to cheek. Yes. Attraction. Attraction. Yes, well, there you were, which is what we've been talking about. Um, mm. uh, so it's hard to imagine how the Earth could attract things without the other things attracting Earth because it's a mutual process, is gravitation. Uh, you can't switch it off just for one object and not the others. Uh, but yes, if the Earth was the only gravitating body in the solar system and everything else had no gravity at all, it probably would collect everything else. We'd wind yes. up in a similar situation to merging black holes. We'd, we'd just end up with one giant planet yeah. of some kind. Right. It yeah. would be a bit of, you know, that would be a bit of a mess too. Yes, I think it would. Yes. So, yes, Chris, that would happen. That would happen. Hmm. All right. Uh, great to hear from you, Chris. Uh, enjoy your infectious diseases and college. Just don't put the two together. It's, wouldn't be pretty. Um, but thanks for sending a question in. Thanks for supporting Space Nuts. Roger, you're live. We're here also. Space Nuts. One final question, Fred. Uh, this one comes from Lee, who is in Canada. Hello, Space Nutters. I'm curious if we have ever been able to collect CME samples from the sun. That is, can a coronal mass ejection have enough velocity to escape the sun's orbit? Uh, it, I expect it would cool down significantly and possibly arrive at Earth as uh, any other asteroid. Uh, have we ever collected this and what can we learn? Thanks and keep up the good work, Lee from Canada. Um, yeah, okay. I, 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 look, the, these things hit us all the time, don't they, Fred? Oh, yeah, no, they well, do. Them, I... Yeah, not, not so much direct hit type of stuff, but um, the after effects. With the well, solar, it, it, solar wind and things like that. Yeah, and, and it, it is the... So a coronal mass ejection is exactly what it sounds like. It's gas being expelled. It's actually a plasma coming off the sun. A plasma is an electrified gas. Uh, comes off the sun at high velocity, a million kilometres an hour or thereabouts. Uh, probably actually quite a lot faster than that when I think about it. Um, it takes a few days to reach the Earth, and when it does, we're showered with the subatomic particles. So mm-hmm. uh, in that sense, the Earth has collected CMEs. They don't solidify in any way. They are still subatomic particles uh, that remain in that state, uh, electrified and travelling at high velocity. And it's when they interact with the upper atmosphere of the Earth that we see the aurora, the northern and southern lights, uh, as these highly energetic particles, um, you know, sort of, energize the atoms of the earth so that when they 
when they become de-energized, they actually radiate light, and we see we see the northern lights. So the northern lights, I guess, are the best thing we've got for collecting CMEs. Uh, it also interferes with the electronics of satellites and things of that sort. Sure does. Uh, but once again, it's on a, on a subatomic level rather than solid lumps of stuff. So in terms of collecting them physically, not on because they are subatomic particles. Yeah, so. that, that's right. They, they just go through whatever it was you tried to You'd need a really good net to be able <laughs> to <laughs> without any of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, the, the, the net's our uh, magnetic field, I suppose. Uh, yes, but that's right. The net, the net is what you know diverts them around the poles of the Earth, which is why we see the aurora so strongly there. Yeah, indeed. All right. Uh, thank you, Lee. Hope that uh, helped you with your question. If you've got a question for us, go to our website. Uh, it's a new look website. I didn't realise that till Hugh told me. Uh, but yeah, it's just slightly changed in design. So uh, you can uh, visit uh, spacenutspodcast.com or spacenuts.io. Send us text or audio questions through the AMA link. And don't forget to leave reviews uh, about the Space Nuts podcast. We always love to hear uh, about what you think. Uh, reviews through whatever platform you use. And Fred, thank you very much. Always a pleasure. Ah, it's always a pleasure talking to you too, Andrew. Thank you. No, you're the first person that's ever said that. Thank you, Fred. (laughs) We'll see you next time. Yeah, sounds good. And thanks to Hugh in the studio for being quiet and not bothering us. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks for your company. We'll see you very soon on another episode of Space Nuts. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.